Hi there. So I'm going to get us going, um, in part because I know that this is going to be a fantastic talk, and I want to save as much time as possible for the content of the talk and for questions. So I know people are filing in for lunch, um, and listen as much as you can. Um, so it is my great honor to introduce Dr. Bedard Gilligan. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences in our department. Um, at the University of Washington. As you will hear today, Dr. Bedard Gilligan is conducting highly important and innovative research in the area of PTSD and substance use. She has a strong track record of independent extramural funding that supports this line of research. Her work throughout her career has been high impact. The work that she has done has influenced the diagnostic criteria for the DSM-5 and influences current theories of PTSD. The work that she's presenting today on cannabis and PTSD is truly the cutting edge of this area. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Deb, for that very lovely introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here on your lunch hour. I'm super appreciative. Um, I'm going to be talking today about some of the work I've been doing on PTSD and cannabis use. Um, before I get started, I want to give one more thank you to Deb and her son, Evan. Um, I have to give them title credit. Uh, I had a very boring title. I'm not very good at marketing. Uh, and they helped me spruce it up a little bit um, to come up with high expectations, impact of cannabis on PTSD recovery, which is why you're all here, right? That title drew you in. Um, it's good stuff. So let me find the clicker here. Um, I also want to start out by acknowledging that research is inherently a collaborative process. Um, I'm very fortunate to get to work with um, a number of individuals across um, departments here at the University of Washington. Um, so my colleagues at the UW Center for Anxiety and Traumatic Stress, which is in the Department of Psychology, as well as my colleagues at the Trauma Recoveries Innovation and the, Sutter study, the Center for the Study of Health and Risk Behaviors, both of which are in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Um, none of the work that I'm going to talk about today would be possible without many individuals across these three um, locations. Um, my research program really is based on understanding recovery processes, processes following exposure to traumatic events. And I have a specific emphasis on understanding the role of substance misuse um, in how people recover following trauma. Um, so given that, I have a couple lines of research currently going on. One is looking sort of at the role of alcohol use um, in recovery following experiences like sexual assault. And the other is what I'm going to talk about today, which is the impact of cannabis use on PTSD recovery. Uh, a general overview of the presentation, I'm going to talk a bit about the PTSD and cannabis overlap. I'm going to talk some about the theories that underlie this co-occurrence. Um, I'm going to talk about what we know about the effects of cannabis on PTSD recovery. And then I'm going to dive into talking about a clinical trial that we currently have running um, that's called Project STEP. And we're going to talk a little bit about what we've learned so far doing that study. Um, and I'm going to give you a sneak peek at some of the analyses we've been able to do on what we've collected so far. Um, Okay, so um, the co-occurrence in PTSD and cannabis. So research in this area is a really emerging area. And I would say the amount of research in PTSD and cannabis use has exploded over the last decade or so. Um, it's become what we might call a really hot topic, um, which is kind of an exciting place to be in terms of starting a research career in this topic. Um, and when we think about the overlap of cannabis and PTSD, there's still a lot of questions about what maintains the relationships between this co-occurrence. And one way I think can sometimes be helpful to frame some of the things that I'm going to talk about today and some of the questions that we all have is in regards to this dichotomy here, which is, is cannabis use following trauma exposure and in the presence of PTSD, is it a problem or is it a solution? And it really depends on who you ask. <laughs> so you're going to get really wide ranging perspectives on that, right? Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is that I'm not sure we know. Like, I'm not sure we really know yet, but what, my, what I'm hoping to do is really highlight what we do know um, and so that we can kind of make, begin to make some informed decisions and choices about what we think, about whether we think it's more of a problem, whether we think it's more of a solution, or whether we think it could be a little bit of both. Um, so trauma exposure, as many of you know, is a fairly common occurrence. So most adults in the United States have experienced at least one event um, that would be considered traumatic. Um, and for most people, um, recovery following trauma exposure is actually the norm. 
So most people get better and they do pretty okay following experiences of trauma with some time and, and support and some other things. Um, but for some people, they go on to develop um, potentially a range of negative outcomes. And there are diverse negative outcomes that are associated with experiencing trauma. These include things like impaired physical health, um, depression, substance misuse, and then of course post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, which is one of the more common diagnoses um, that occurs following trauma exposure and is a diagnosis that is considered both conceptually and etiologically linked to the experience of trauma itself. And when PTSD does develop, we have a variety of efficacious treatments that we can offer patients. These include talk therapies and medication options. Um, in general, the medications that have received probably the most robust support for treatment of PTSD are the SSRI medications. And we generally see um, effect sizes, moderate sized effects in terms of reducing PTSD with SSRIs. And then we have a variety of psychotherapies, almost all of which are based on cognitive behavioral principles um, and show really large effects in terms of decreasing PTSD symptoms. However, despite these good treatment options, we still have a number of patients that don't respond. So not everybody gets better with what we have to offer. Um, in addition, some, some patients don't want to do these treatments. They opt out or they don't want to engage in them. And so we as clinicians are often looking for alternatives and so are patients. So patients are often pursuing other avenues to try and manage symptoms. Um, and in recent years, cannabis use has emerged as a fairly common behavior in the aftermath of trauma exposure, particularly for patients who have developed PTSD. Um, PTSD is one of the most commonly reported reasons that is cited by patients who are seeking out cannabis, medical cannabis. So in states where it's legal, um, for patients who are seeking med medical cannabis, they're often reporting PTSD as a primary motivator. Um, in addition, we see higher use of cannabis in individuals with PTSD compared to those without the disorder. Um, so specifically, individuals with PTSD are about two, two and a half times more likely to report lifetime cannabis use, and they're about two times more likely to report daily cannabis use in the last year. And for at least some of these patients or some of these folks who are using cannabis regularly, it comes at a cost. So um, cannabis use and cannabis use disorder are um, both increasing in the U.S. population. Um, so this is true on the whole across the population, and it's also true in individuals with PTSD. So PTSD is associated with in increased rates of cannabis use disorder. And with the rising rates of cannabis use disorder in both the general population and specific populations like individuals with PTSD, um, we've had increased attention on what are sort of the evidence-based treatment options for cannabis use disorder. Um, and generally, behavioral treatments for cannabis use disorder have about moderate effects. Most of them are based on either CBT strategies, motivational enhancement strategies, contingency manage management strategies, and they have about moderate effects in decreasing cannabis use and its associated harms. Um, and we did, I did a recent review of the cannabis use disorder treatment literature with Dr. Will Acklin, who's um, a program officer at NIDA and the director of their behavioral intervention development program. And he and I conducted a review of what's out there on treat behavioral treatments for cannabis use disorder. And we were able to make some kind of broad conclusions. Um, first, we concluded that abstinence rates following treatment for cannabis use disorder are pretty low. So most patients are not achieving abstinence at the end of a behavioral treatment for cannabis use disorder. In addition, we found that dropout is about moderate to high. Um, so a lot of patients aren't completing treatment um, and that there's no course that's winning the race. <laughs> so there's a lot of treatments out there, um, treatment packages out there, and there is no gold standard. There is no active behavioral treatment for cannabis use disorder that stands above the rest in terms of being the most effective approach. Um, in addition, although we know we have treatments for PTSD, as I talked about earlier, we have treatments for cannabis use disorder, we don't know as much about how these treatments work for patients who have both, so patients who have the co-occurrence. We also aren't totally clear on what we do first. Do we treat cannabis use disorder? Do we treat PTSD um, first? Do we try to do them together? Um, we have less information on that. Um, and in addition, as what I said earlier, there's a lot of patients out there who don't necessarily want to change their cannabis use. So this is that problem solution thing that's going to come up a whole bunch of times today. Um, but patients may not see it as a problem. And so and they may not want to engage in treatment for cannabis use disorder. So what do we do then, right? Um, and it is true that many patients see more benefits than harms associated with their cannabis use, particularly when PTSD is on board. Um, and some of the theories that underlie the comorbidity of PTSD and cannabis use really hit on this notion. So particularly something like self-medication theory, 
where self-medication theory explains the overlap of PTSD and cannabis use by saying that, you know, patients with PTSD, their symptoms are really distressing. Um, so they use a substance like cannabis in order to medicate or decrease those symptoms. Um, this is somewhat effective. It's negatively reinforcing to them. Um, the cannabis use is negatively reinforced because the bad feeling, the distress goes away, and then their cannabis use escalates and they continue to use, right? Um, and self-medication theory is probably the primary explanation we have that we tend to use for the overlap of PTSD and cannabis. Um, and it's supported by some of the research. So anxiety management, distress tolerance, hyperarousal symptoms, particularly sleep, which if any of you work with patients who have sleep problems and use cannabis, you know this is a really big one. Um, these are things that patients who are using cannabis will say motivate them. They're things they say they get out of it um, that they find helpful. Um, and we've done some research in this area as well. So um, my, myself, along with some colleagues, have looked at a sample of individuals with PTSD who are treatment seeking. Um, and we were interested in finding out what might predict the co-occurrence of substance use disorders in this sample. Um, and what we found is that comorbidity, particularly major depressive disorder, um, and exposure to more tra traumatic stressors, the more trauma exposure you had, were both predictors of co-occurring substance use, including cannabis use disorder. Um, in addition, other researchers have found that PTSD severity will predict using cannabis to cope with distress. Um, and so certainly looking at all this data together, there seems to be broad support for a link between experiencing negative emotions and distress and then using cannabis, as self-medication theory might suggest. More recently, um, we wanted to look at these relationships between PTSD and cannabis use at a little bit of a finer level. And so we conducted a study where we looked at daily reports of PTSD symptoms and cannabis use to try and tease out some functional relationships. So this is a study that was led by Dr. Dem Emily Dworkin, Emily, oh God, Emily Dworkin <laughs> in the Department of Psychiatry. He's a senior fellow with us. Um, and we looked at a sample of sexual minority women, um, which is a population that's particularly high risk for trauma exposure, PTSD, and substance use. Um, and we collected daily reports of PTSD symptoms along with daily reports of cannabis use. And what we found is that um, a person's average PTSD severity, so the average level of PTSD symptoms that they had, predicted cannabis use on that same day. What we did not find was that deviations from one average, one's average predicted cannabis use. So we saw this overall severity effect, um, but when we looked at how much worse are you today than you normally are, we didn't see a relationship. We didn't see a significant relationship. Um, and so it really seems that PTSD confers a general risk for using cannabis, possibly to medicate those symptoms, um, but it's not necessarily a sort of in the state-dependent variable, right? It's not necessarily an in the moment. So in other words, um, it's sort of a conditioned response. Mm. Cannabis use might be kind of a conditioned response to having severe PTSD symptoms, but PTSD symptoms may not be the proximal trigger that's triggering cannabis use in the moment, at least according to this study, where we looked at these relationships at the daily level. And as far as I know, it's still the only study so far that has looked at these relationships at the daily level. Did you ever <clears throat> think about trying to correlate their PTSD symptoms two days after cannabis mm -hmm. use? Mm -hmm. So I don't remember if we did it, but we thought about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we have thought about that. And that's almost like a mutual maintenance model um, where it seems like can PTSD triggers cannabis, but cannabis might also trigger PTSD, whether it's withdrawal or some other kind of function. Um, and we've talked a lot about that and, and what could be gained from possibly looking at that. And it's a it's a certainly good hypothesis. Um, it, I don't remember if we looked at it and decided not to report it or if we never got around to looking at it. I'm not actually sure. One, one step at a time, right? Research is incremental. <laughs> but I like what you're thinking. I mean, I think that's really important to think about these functional relationships and the fact that they probably do go in two directions, not just one. Yeah. Um, we also wanted to, we've also done some research to sort of um, better understand how patients view the effects of cannabis on PTSD symptoms, so some more qualitative research. Um, so in addition to looking at the quantitative relationships, also looking at PTSD, uh, individuals with PTSD's perceptions of cannabis and what it does for them and doesn't do for them. Uh, and it's clear that patients perceive a lot of clinical benefit to their cannabis use. Um, so for sure, patients will report that it's really, really helpful. Um, things we have heard when we've collected this information are things like, marijuana makes it so I do not have to take any heavy narcotic pain medications. 
Um, marijuana replaces an obscene amount of things that I have been prescribed and tried in the past with less successful results. Um, so to me, these really sound like harm reduction. They are basically saying that for me, using cannabis is a way of reducing harm associated with other things I can do to manage my symptoms, right? Um, in addition, we also hear things like, I use it to calm my anxiety and focus more on self-care. So this belief that it's anxiolytic, it helps me to feel calmer, it helps me to feel less stressed, it helps me to feel less anxious. Um, and when we look at the reasons that individuals endorse for using cannabis, this is also really consistent. So in our sample of patients with PTSD who are using cannabis, um, what we saw was about over half said they were, or, uh, yeah, so one of the reasons, the most commonly endorsed reason was anxiety. So the most common reason patients said that they were using cannabis was to calm my anxiety. PTSD and sleep were a close second, um, pain, depression, eating, and concentration. So all things that certainly kind of validate this notion that patients are using cannabis to, to help with their PTSD symptoms. They're all either PTSD symptoms or their associated features of PTSD. Um, and it's not just patients. So uh, medical professionals and researchers have also begun to wonder about whether there might be something to this, right? We're hearing a lot of patient reports. In many ways, the area of PTSD and cannabis is a very patient-driven area of research. The patients are really driving it forward in that they're either asking for it or they're telling us they're doing it anyway. <laughs> and I think a lot of people have sort of risen to that occasion of saying, okay, well, let's take a look at this and see what we can learn about it. And there's been a lot of speculation this has been true for a long time, but especially more recently, that perhaps the endocannabinoid system may actually be a really fruitful avenue for decreasing PTSD symptoms. Um, and this is because we know that the CB1 receptors or cannabinoid receptors are very heavily and densely populated in areas of the brain that are implicated in the processing of things like fear, stress, emotion, and reward, which are all brain areas and all experiences that are implicated in post-traumatic stress disorder. And so there's the thought that either targeting the, endo, targeting the endocannabinoid system, possibly even using exogenous cannabinoids, might be a way to bring about symptom change. Um, there are, of course, some caveats. Um, for one, the exogenous cannabinoids that we have are very diverse in terms of what they're made up of. And so it's very hard to pinpoint down exactly what we are giving sometimes <laughs> and using. Um, and then the endocannabinoid cannabinoid system is extremely diffuse. So it's very diffuse throughout the body. And both of these things have sort of added, kind of added to some concerns about, I don't know how effectively we could actually leverage the system. But that being said, it is still often mentioned as a potential treatment target and a place where we can develop new novel treatment approaches um, for PTSD. And when we think about cannabis as a potential treatment for PTSD, there's a couple different, sorry, <laughs> there's a couple different ways that we might confer therapeutic benefit. So there's a couple different routes through which it might actually make a difference. Um, the first is it could manage the emotional symptoms. So this is the more straightforward explanation of it. It's got anxiolytic properties. Um, and so if we capitalize on those effects, it could manage the symptoms associated with PTSD and anxiety. Um, the second way it might confer potential therapeutic benefit is through actually changing the processes of learning that are associated with recovery following trauma. And that's what I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about now, because in some ways that is the much more interesting potential um, in terms of what cannabis might be able to do for us in the treatment of PTSD. So this um, extinction learning, which I'm going to describe in a minute, but extinction learning is highly implicated in PTSD, when it, why it develops and why it maintains. And this is a schematic that we put together um, for a chapter we recently wrote, where we sort of present all of the factors or many of the factors that we think predict vulnerability to developing PTSD and persistent PTSD. So things like pre-trauma factors, like the genetic makeup of an individual, the intelligence of an individual, the trauma, the amount of trauma exposure they've had in their lifetime, all of those things are going to predict how vulnerable they are to developing chronic PTSD. In addition, peritraumatic factors, such as how severe was the trauma, um, how did they react during the trauma, these are also things that are going to predict who's likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And then finally, the post-trauma factors, um, which is things like life stress, 
social support, um, negative beliefs, avoidance patterns. And these factors are the ones that really receive the most research support, the most robust support as being the drivers of who ends up developing PTSD. They come out as sort of much larger effects in predicting PTSD compared to pre-trauma factors and peri-traumatic factors, these post-trauma factors. And they're all related to this process of extinction learning. So all of these things are going to play into why we think individuals with PTSD might have impaired fear extinction. Um, and we do think that a failure in natural fear extinction is probably a key mechanism in the persistence of PTSD. So we know that trauma-related pathology is really best conceptualized as the persistence of maladaptive reactions. Um, so after trauma exposure, almost all individuals have symptoms of some kind, but for many people they go away and it's only minority people who actually those symptoms persist and turn into post-traumatic stress disorder. So the question is always why? Like, what is it about those folks where they get PTSD? Um, and the, the, the um, detriments in their natural fear extinction are considered a leading explanation for why that might be happening. And so I'm sure that many of you in the room are actually familiar with fear extinction, but I'm going to go ahead and explain it um, just to make sure we're all on the same page. And to do that, we kind of have to start with fear conditioning. So classic fear conditioning models really seek to explain how people learn to become afraid um, of things that um, they, how people learn to become afraid. Um, so, um, and the, the really, the premise of this model is that um, a neutral stimuli gets paired with something negative or aversive, and we then end up with kind of a pairing that leads to conditioned fear. So the best way to explain it is with an example. Um, so we might have something like a dog, which for most of us is probably a pretty neutral, um, ambiguous stimuli. I see some smiles, so I suspect there's actually some positive associations with dogs in the room. Um, he is very cute, I completely agree. Um, but for many people, it's neutral. Um, but but if it gets paired with something aversive, um, an unconditioned stimuli, so something that's aversive to almost all of us, so in this case it might be like a dog bite, um, what we're going to have is an unconditioned reaction of fear, right, or anxiety, because it's an aversive thing that just happened. And what happens with fear conditioning is that neutral stimuli now becomes a conditioned stimuli. So the previously neutral, ambiguous very cute dog, has now become the conditioned stimuli. And even in the absence of the negative thing, the unconditioned stimulus, even in the absence of that bite, the dog can evoke fear, right? And this is how people can learn to become afraid. Um, fear extinction, on the other hand, is the process by which individuals learn to inhibit that conditioned response. Um, and so in the example we just used, we might have something like, the, we might take the conditioned stimulus and we might present it over and over again in the absence of the unconditioned stimulus. So we take the dog and we present it over, or a different dog, and we present it over and over and over <laughs> again <laughs> without the unconditioned stimulus occurring, right? Without the bite occurring. And over time, what ends up happening is that conditioned response becomes inhibited. And the person no longer responds with the fear and anxiety that they had during the initial conditioning. So we, we in inhibit that response. Um, so that's the process of fear, extinct, fear conditioning and fear extinction. And we think about trauma exposure is actually, or trauma um, recovery is being very similar. So we think of trauma exposure as a very potent, very powerful unconditioned stimulus. Um, so in this example, we might see a rape victim who'd been raped in her home. And what we see is that through fear conditioning, a previously neutral stimulus, her home, is paired with an unconditioned stimulus, the rape, and it results in the unconditioned response of fear. Um, and then that home becomes a conditioned stimulus. So just being home, just being alone in her home, just being in a certain room in her home, whatever it is, now revokes that conditioned response of fear, even in the absence of something like a rape. Um, and fear extinction is also a similar process, where if we can present that conditioned stimulus over and over again, without the presence of the unconditioned stimulus, the aversive thing, we will be, inhibit, we will be able to inhibit that conditioned response. Okay, so it's the same principles that we think underlie many of our effective treatments for PTSD. And I want to make that link. So this slide looks familiar, obviously. It was up earlier. Um, but what I want to show is the clinical link between extinction learning and how we, we often treat PTSD. Um, many of our therapies are actually based on these principles of extinction learning. So all of our therapies that include an element of exposure are based on principles of extinction. Thank you. Are based on principles. It was getting very noisy out in the hallway. <laughs> are based in principles of extinction learning. And they are some of the therapies that have the strongest effects for decreasing PTSD symptoms. Um, 
And so when we're doing fear extinction in the context of something like an exposure therapy, it looks very similar to what I just described, where we have a condition that's the therapist's job to sort of help a patient approach the conditioned stimuli in the absence of the unconditioned stimuli until we can inhibit that conditioned response. And we might, we would do this for many different situations um, and many different occurrences in order to get kind of all of the generalized responses that the individual with PTSD has developed. Um, but it's important to remember that when we're doing this process, um, <coughs> extinction learning is not actually erasing the original learning. We know this because fear can come back. So that conditioned response can return even after we've done extinction of fear. So we know we're not releasing the original learning. We are just teaching the person to inhibit it. Um, and that's important because you know, if fear can return after exposure therapy, then a lot of people question, what can we do to make our exposure therapies more robust or more strong, right? Um, and this is where some of the literature on things like methylene blue and yohimbine, and maybe the one that's more familiar, decyclosiring, come in, where we can activate neurochemical substrates in the brain to enhance extinction learning. By activating those um, brain regions that are implicated in extinction learning, we can make it more robust. And interestingly enough, this might be where cannabis comes into play as well. <laughs> um, so there is actually some thinking that cannabis could have a very similar facilitation effect on extinction learning. So we know that there's very densely populated CB1 receptors in the areas of the brain where extinction learning is happening. Um, and so if we provide something like a CB agonist or cannabis um, while extinction learning is going on, we may be able to consolidate that learning. At the same time, there could be some reason to think that cannabis could have a detrimental effect on extinction learning. Um, so remember that for extinction learning to work, um, you actually have to approach the conditioned stimulus. You actually have to go out there and do it, right? Um, and the amotivational effects of cannabis are well documented. Um, and so we are well aware. <laughs> um, so we are well aware, right, that cannabis is associated um, with a motivation, with a lack of motivational behavior. And that might get in the way of something like approach. Um, in addition, cannabis has anxiolytic effects, which is in fact what many people like about it. Um, but if that is true and we're not able to actually access the conditioned responses during extinction learning, it may not have as much of an effect. So on the one hand, could it be a facilitator? Yeah. Could it also have a detriment? Maybe. And so what I'm going to do now is present some of the data um, that's looking at what we know about cannabis and fear extinction. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> um, so in studies using animal models um, of fear conditioning and extinction, we can demonstrate pretty robustly that CB1 agonists, so compounds that activate CB receptors, um, have fairly robust um, facilitation effects on extinction learning. And so what I have here is some data from an example study um, where you can see that um, rats that were administered a, a CB agonist, um, which is the bar that says AM404 on the side, um, compared to placebo, um, extinction fear better than rats that were not administered that. Um, and this is a fairly, like I said, robust finding in their literature. The caveat to that is that um, rats administered chronic higher doses actually sometimes show impaired fear extinction. So it does seem like the patterns of cannabis use, or in this case, administration, since they're rats, um, may actually matter in terms of the effects it has on fear extinction. There's only been, uh-huh. Any, any guess about what kind of cannabis human consumption doses that might uh, correlate to? <laughs> so we're going to talk about that. Yeah, so I'm kind of moving in that direction a little bit. Um, I'm just going to tell you right now, we don't know. <laughs> so I'll just like break the, you know, surprise ending. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about what we do have. Yeah. Might there be some state-dependent learning to protect? So let's say if the cannabis stays around for 30 days, mm -hmm. uh, you've got a continuation of state-dependent, and then once the uh, cannabis goes out, it's gone. Mm -hmm. so how long around how long you measure the rat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it could be a temporary thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually going to allude to that on this slide right here, where there's only been a few studies that have been done in humans. Um, but the ones we have done in humans, um, so they administered THC to see if it would facilitate short-term extinction learning. And what you can see from this slide is that it did. So for individuals who were administered THC during extinction, they showed more reductions in skin conductance response compared to individuals who were administered the placebo. Um, 
However, that may be limited to acute effects and whether it's state dependent or I'm not, I, we don't know, they didn't kind of speculate on that. Um, but in another study who looked at a longer term follow-up, um, so instead of an immediate follow-up, but a longer term, found that although they found the effect at immediate, when they looked long-term, the THC and the placebo groups looked similar. So they were no longer looking different. Um, another caveat to, the, to these studies that were done in humans is that they've all so far been done in healthy cannabis naive volunteers. So no studies have yet looked at individuals with PTSD symptoms. So um, no one from the Pacific Northwest was involved. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Ironically, we're one of the few places who aren't doing a cannabis administration right now. <laughs> um, in addition, um, actually, I'm going to go back. Uh, yeah. So um, in addition, there's been a very recent study that looked at chronic cannabis users and how they performed on extinction learning tasks. Um, and what they found was that re um, uh, the individuals who were using cannabis showed both reduced within session and between session extinction as measured by skin conductance response compared to the control group that were non-cannabis users. So they're showing a detrimental effect on naturalistic chronic cannabis use on extinction learning outcomes. And this is consist consistent with the rat literature where I showed that if you use it, if they give rats too, <laughs> if they use it, if the rats are given cannabis <laughs> too chronically and at too high doses, then it might be the opposite, a detrimental effect instead of a facilitation effect. And that seems to be what we're seeing in humans as well. Um, so um, no studies, as I mentioned, have yet looked at fear extinction in individuals with PTSD and how cannabis might interact there. Um, and in addition, no studies have yet looked at P um, cannabis as the, and how it might relate to extinction of fear in individuals with PTSD. So looking at it as in relation to exposure therapy, for example. Um, but we do have is just a few studies that have looked at the administration of cannabis um, to see what it does to PTSD symptoms. And I'm going to go through these somewhat quickly. Um, we are currently in the middle of doing a review and meta-analysis of what's out there on cannabis and PTSD recovery. And um, we've only found three studies that have actually administered cannabis for the treatment of PTSD in humans. Um, uh, the first, and they're all very small sample sizes, um, and they're all open trials. So they don't, they are not characterized by the kind of controls that we normally like to see in our clinical trials. Um, and so that's why I'm going to talk about them somewhat briefly. Um, so study one, um, this was the first study where they looked at oral THC. They had administered it for three weeks to just 10 patients. Um, and what they found was that at the end of the three weeks, patients who were, um, patients showed a significant decrease in arousal symptoms. Um, they did not show significant decreases in intrusions, avoidance, or overall PTSD severity. So three weeks of THC administration, all we saw was a significant decrease in arousal in these 10 people. Post. No, it was pre and then post. Okay. Yeah. No, <laughs> it was not washed out of their system by the time they measured it, um, but that was sort of the end of their treatment period. They did not do a washout phase. They did not say, come back in a month. This was immediately post-administration. Yeah. Again, not, these studies aren't characterized by the kind of controls that we would normally want, so it certainly does complicate findings. Um, although you might expect even stronger findings there, right? <laughs> Given that cannabis might have still been in their system, you might have actually expect to see more decreases than what we saw. Um, in the second study, um, it was a delivery of a CB agonist for the treatment of nightmares. Um, this was, again, a sample of 10 people. Um, these were folks who were seeking treatment for PTSD-related nightmares in particular, and they were all treatment-resistant to standard medication for PTSD nightmares. Um, what, we found, what they did was they took these 10 people and they gave them seven weeks of either nabilone, which is CB agonist, or placebo. And then they followed by a two-week washout phase, and then they got the other treatment. And what they found is that after getting nabilone, um, there was a significant reduction in clinician-rated nightmare frequency and intensity using a one-item measure. Um, and, and they were more likely to be, related, be rated as globally improved um, after receiving nabilone compared to placebo. The third study, um, again, looked at a CB agonist, so again at Nabilone, actually, for the treatment of nightmares. Um, this was 47 military personnel who presented to a treatment clinic with, again, treatment-resistant nightmares. Um, they were given Nabilone for anywhere from 4 to 12 months. It depended on side effects, 
patient engagement, provider judgment, lots of different things. Um, but what they found is that, you know, over that period, um, the uh, almost 60% of patients reported a complete cessation of nightmares. Um, and about 13% reported a reduction in nightmares when receiving the nabilone. Um, what they also found, however, though, was this, um, that uh, when they discontinued the nabilone, less than 1% of patients maintain their gains. So less 1% of patients continue to report either a reduction or a complete cessation of nightmares. So very, very few. Um, and so it does seem that these effects on nightmares and sleep um, are temporary. So they're there when the agonist is on board, um, but then as soon as it's not, the sleep the nightmares return. Um, and as I mentioned, there aren't any studies yet that have started to look at cannabis and extinction learning based treatments. Um, and that's, you know, one of the hypotheses about why cannabis might be helpful for PTSD. And so we took some, um, we just recently published a paper where we looked at some of the data we have on individuals who are treatment seeking for PTSD. So this was 200 individuals who were enrolled in a clinical trial here at the University of Washington and at our sister site in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and they were receiving either sertraline or pro prolonged exposure for the treatment of PTSD. Um, and we looked at individuals with and without cannabis use to better understand their engagement in treatment and their treatment outcome. Um, and what we found is that the patients who were using cannabis were significantly more likely to drop out. So they were actually twice as likely to drop out of treatment, whether it be therapy or medication, it wasn't actually moderated by treatment type. They were significantly more likely to drop out of treatment than individuals who weren't using cannabis. In addition, what we found was that the cannabis use was associated with less PTSD recovery. Um, so individuals who were using cannabis had higher PTSD severity at six month follow up than individuals who were not. Um, I want to be really clear that they got better. <laughs> so I want to be really clear that these patients that were using cannabis did benefit from treatment. Everybody got better, whether or not they were using cannabis. Um, they just didn't get quite as much better as the individuals who weren't using, um, which is the opposite of what we might expect if it was having some kind of facilitation effect on extinction learning, because uh, more than half of these folks were getting exposure to treatment. Is the difference between those lines explained just by the dropout? Um, no, it's not. So we did control for that and it, no, it was not. Yeah, it's a good question though. Yeah. These, these were presumably chronic users, not just? Not necessarily. There were people who re reported use in the last 30 days um, when they came in for treatment. There were chronic PTSD, um, but in terms of cannabis, um, their initiation of cannabis use could have started at any point as long as they were using in the last 30 days. So they were actively using. Okay, um, so uh, you know it's clear that we still have a lot of questions on how cannabis use might affect PTSD treatment and recovery. Um, and what we wanna start to do is really better understand how we can integrate some of what we know about extinction learning into the clinical trials we're doing for PTSD. And this could really help us explain some of the discrepancy between animal models and human data um, and really take into account some of the real world variability we see in extinction um, and cannabis use for, for people, for individuals who are patients. It also can give us a better understanding of the mechanism of change. So is extinction learning really what's happening here? And is it different for individuals with and without cannabis use? Um, and so to sum up some of the remaining questions before I transition into talking about our current study, um, PTSD is an approved condition for medical cannabis in the state of Washington. This sort of implies the efficacy of the approach, but as I presented, the data to support that is actually quite limited and pretty inconsistent. Um, and we also have to think about the theory of why we think cannabis might work. So if we do think that it's based on this extinction learning principles, then approach is absolutely crucial. Um, and so to the extent that cannabis users are amotivational or not actually going out and doing that on their own, cannabis as a standalone treatment is unlikely to be helpful. Um, same thing with anxiolytic effects. So these are well documented, but they also seem to be temporary. We also know there's biphasic effects that I didn't talk too much about, but there's these, you know, uh, 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 anxiolytic effects at low doses and um, more anxiogenic effects at higher doses. Um, and so again, you know, how that would work in terms of sustaining long-term change for patients is still a really open question. Um, and we're actually doing a study right now that I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about um, is trying to answer at least some of these questions. So 
It's called Project STEP, which stands for Short-Term Exposure for PTSD. It is a PTSD treatment trial um, where we're administering brief imaginal exposure um, to individuals who all have chronic PTSD, half of which have heavy chronic cannabis use and half of which don't. Um, and we're interested in looking at both extinction learning processes um, and then also treatment engagement and treatment response for these individuals. And so in terms of our study questions, we have um, translational questions. So we have tra translational paradigm questions about what basic extinction learning processes look like, particularly as a pre-treatment marker. So how, what does it look like pre-treatment before we even begin PTSD recovery? And does it look different for individuals with and without cannabis use? And then we have questions about the therapeutic effects. So what does a brief exposure protocol look like for individuals who are heavily using cannabis and for individuals who are not? Um, and then we want to link them. So we want to be able to understand how do the basic extinction learning processes predict or not predict clinical outcome? Um, and is it related to cannabis use? So we are recruiting a sample of individuals who, like I said, have chronic PTSD. Um, so they all have a current PTSD diagnosis based on DSM-5 criteria, minimum duration of 12 weeks post-trauma exposure, um, adults between the ages of 18 and 65. Um, we are recruiting a group that has current heavy cannabis use. So this is five plus days per week for three months or more. And then we're recruiting a group that has no cannabis use for the last three months. Um, who is not eligible, so our, our exclusion criteria were really selected to maximize generalizability, so to be as limited as possible, um, but also ensure safety of participants and ensure that what we're, that participants we're recruiting are appropriate for a first-line PTSD treatment. So it's things like active psychosis, um, active suicidal ideation, uh, unstable medication doses that would get in the way of us teasing out effects and stuff. Um, our main outcome measure really is PTSD symptom severity. So we're most interested in PTSD symptom change. So looking post-treatment and then through a three-month follow-up. Um, but in addition, we're also interested in cannabis use. So we're interested in cannabis use outcomes and patterns of cannabis use and drop out from treatment. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we do know that in patients who are using cannabis drop out more. And so we want to look at how that looks in this trial. Um, we're also interested in treatment process, and so we want to look at within and between session change and distress, which is often considered a marker of extinction learning. So when you're doing an exposure-based therapy, how much your distress goes down either within a given session or between treatment sessions can be a marker of how much you're extinguishing your conditioned response, in this case your, your fear or your PTSD symptoms. So we're collecting self-report ratings of distress, so the classic SUD scale, 0 to 100, how distressed are you right now, how anxious are you right now, um, other emotion ratings and then PTSD symptoms at every session. Um, and we're also collecting psychophysiological and biological indicators. So things like heart rate, blood pressure, and cortisol um, during exposure sessions. So we can better understand what those markers of emotion um, look like for individuals with or without cannabis use. Um, and then finally, we're doing, because we are doing this, this translational paradigm, we are doing this basic lab task. We're also collecting fear potentiated startle and skin conductance in response to the task at baseline um, so we can get a better sense of how they're extinguishing fear in that kind of lab task. Um, the lab task is um, a fear, discrimination, and extinction task that I'm not going to spend a ton of time on, but if anyone has questions about it, I'd be happy to talk about it later. Um, it's a pretty standard task that used, that's used in the PTSD literature. It starts with a fear acquisition phase where we have a neutral stimulus that's paired with an unconditioned stimulus, um, a second neutral stimulus that's never paired with the unconditioned stimulus, and then a third neutral stimulus that's paired with both. And that's to help tease apart the discriminative ability of, of the stimulus that's paired with the unconditioned stimulus. Um, and in this case, our unconditioned stimulus is an air puff, which I can tell you is quite aversive. <laughs> I have been, I've been a test subject for many an RA who is learning to run this protocol, um, and it is quite aversive, um, and it does evoke reactions. Um, so we do a fear, ex a fear acquisition phase, and then that's followed by a fear extinction phase, where the neutral stimuli are presented repeatedly, um, but in the absence of any air blast at all. So it, none of them are paired with an unconditioned stimulus. Um, and the dependent variables, as I mentioned earlier, are fear potentiated startle throughout the extinction trials and skin conductance response as well. Um, our imaginal exposure paradigm. So this is the treatment that everybody's getting. Um, so all of our individuals, cannabis using or not, are receiving the same imaginal exposure intervention, um, which is an exposure protocol for PTSD. So it's a 
shortened um, bare bones exposure based protocol for PTSD. So it's six 50 minute sessions that we deliver daily. Um, it is based on the PE manual. Um, but it does not include any, or the prolonged exposure manual, sorry. Um, it does not include any in vivo exposure. It doesn't include any breathing retraining, and it doesn't include any homework. It is just five, it is just six 50 minute sessions with the therapist. Um, and like I said, they are held daily, uh, kind of. We don't work weekends. <laughs> so they're not completely daily, but they're pretty close to daily. So they are back to back. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why we're doing um, treatment this way. Um, so one is that if we really are gonna see any enhancements effect, uh, enhancement effects of cannabis, um, then we need to underdose. Like in order to see if it can enhance outcome, we need to underdose the protocol, we need to underdose the treatment. Um, the second reason that we're doing it is because by not doing any outside of session exposure, it gives us a lot more control over what everybody's getting. So all they're getting, everybody, is what they get from the therapist in the room. And so we're able to control that much better. The third reason we're doing it, which is potentially the most interesting reason, um, is because of this dropout problem. So we, have, we know that people who use cannabis drop out of treatment. And so if we can make the protocol shorter and get benefit, we might be better retaining people all the way to the end. Um, we're also doing it daily for that reason. So as, as you know, you know, a lot of the reason patients don't complete treatment is because things get in the way right? We often tell our patients, come back next week. Well, a lot happens in a week. <laughs> um, and so, and when we have substance using patients, often more happens um, than for other people. And so if all we have to say is just come back tomorrow, just come back tomorrow, just come back tomorrow, um, we might be able to retain them better than if we're spacing them out more. Um, other than that, the protocol looks fairly typical of exposure. So the first session is devoted to psychoeducation and rationale. Um, and then the remaining five treatment sessions are devoted to exposure principles where the individual is coming in and they're reliving their trauma memory, which is a standard way of delivering exposure for PTSD. Um, and throughout, we're measuring things like SUDS, um, cortisol, blood pressure, all those things that I talked about. Um, for cannabis use, we are looking at naturalistic cannabis use. So we have, we are not administering. Um, this is just individuals who are naturally using and they're given no instruction to change or sustain their use over the course of the study. Um, we are assessing it fairly in-depthly though. So we're assessing strain, amount of use, administration, perceived high, all of those things at pretty much every time they come into our lab. Um, we're also doing urine collection so that we can assess metabolites associated with both THC and CBD, the main component components that are used in cannabis that people are purchasing. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to talk about are some of the preliminary findings we have so far. So this study is still underway, um, but what I'm going to be talking about is some of what we've seen so far and the therapeutic effects in particular. Um, and particularly, I'm going to talk about dropout from treatment, um, cannabis use at each session and what we're seeing that look like, and then the within and between session changes in distress. So the self-reported um, indicators of distress that might be a marker of extinction learning. So currently our recruitment is about 50% complete. Um, this slide says we have 31 people um, and the results I'm gonna be showing you today have 31 people, but they made these a little while ago. So we actually have 33 people now. <laughs> Every person counts. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've been oversampling patients with cannabis use over the past year. So our groups are about equal. Um, in fact, our cannabis group is a little bit larger than our no cannabis group right now. Um, the primary reason we're getting for exclusion at the screening level, so when people phone into the study to be part of it, is that their cannabis use isn't enough. So they're not using five times a week um, for the past three months. The primary reason once they come in the door to see us is that their PTSD is not primary and not severe enough. Um, and this is a pretty typical reason for exclusion in a PTSD trial. This is often the highest rate, the highest reason for exclusion. In terms of our dropout, um, what we are seeing so far is that our dropout is low compared to other treatments for co-occurring PTSD in samples with co-occurring PTSD and substance use. So we currently have a dropout rate of 21%, um, which is actually slightly lower than what we see in PTSD treatment trials that don't include substance use, and is definitely lower than what we're seeing in PTSD treatment trials with substance use in populations, where dropout rates are more like 36 to 62%. So our 21% is looking pretty good, um, and we're pretty encouraged by that, actually. 
I'm going to move now to talk through um, what we have to present, what we have done so far um, with the, the analysis of THC metabolites. Um, so I'm going to present some data on urine samples um, that we've collected um, and what we've seen in terms of the metabolites that are showing up um, at the different kind of um, recordings. So what I have up here is three example patients, um, and I'm going to present four different metabolites that we've identified. So this work is done in collaboration with Nepi Stella in the Department of Pharmacology. Um, who unfortunately couldn't be here, but promises me he's going to watch. Um, but what, and he's going to correct me on anything I say wrong. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but what we see here um, are green, red, and green lines at the bottom, right, that represent three of our four metabolites. And those are the metabolites that we would expect to sort of stay together and stay low in chronic users. So in individuals who are using chronically and in a sort of regimented way, like they use every night before bed, they use every morning when they get up, they use every day at their lunch hour, whatever it is, we would expect those lines to sort of stay low and go together. And for the most part, we're seeing that in these individuals. But it's that orange line um, that shows on each graph um, that indicates more of the proximal use that may be sort of the most interesting one. And that line, when it spikes, the further it goes away from those green and red lines, um, the more it's indicating proximal use, so use right before coming to session. And so what we can see is for this person, um, and what we have here is the first dot represents their baseline extinction task. The second dot represents their first exposure session. Um, and then third, second exposure session, third exposure session, fourth exposure session, and final exposure session. Um, and what we're seeing is that this is a person who appears to have used right before coming in to do um, their first exposure and their second exposure. Um, and then after that, it does not appear that they were using proximal to, to coming to session. Similar thing for person number two, where we're seeing a spike um, at, at their first exposure session. And then person three, where we're seeing not the spike until the very end of treatment. And then around session five, we're seeing a spike. Um, and why are we seeing this? We don't know. I want to be really clear about that. <laughs> it's tempting to say they were coming to do exposure. They used cannabis to self-medicate their symptoms. And that very well might be true. Um, exposure is hard work, right? Um, that being said, we don't actually know that from this data. All we know is that that's what's happening here, that they're using right before coming to session. And what we plan to do is actually use some of our indicators, so our PTSD symptom reports, our SUDS ratings, um, our cortisol, our blood pressure, and really, really try to link it to the metabolites that's in a person's system and how they're experiencing emotion in that session um, and how they're experiencing their distress level in that session as well. Um, and as far as I know, we're the first people to be able to do this, to be able to tease the, out these metabolites in this way and potentially make something clinically meaningful out of them. Um, in addition, um, I wanted to present the data that we have on within and between session change. So with, within a session fear reduction and between session fear reduction. And again, these can be considered potentially markers of extinction learning. Um, so for our 31 people who've completed treatment so far, um, we had um, uh, what you see here is that the change in subjective distress um, within a given session. And so their peak distress, the most distress they felt within that session, minus how they ended the session. And that's what we considered the change from beginning to end. Um, and what we see is that the heavy users, the heavy cannabis users, are reporting more change in distress um, than the no use group. So than the no cannabis use group. Um, so they are reporting higher, they're reporting more change from peak to end than their no using counterparts. Um, Across session, um, distress ratings, we're actually seeing something a little bit different. We're not actually seeing these lines diverge nearly as much. And so from be, across sessions, from session two to six, the first exposure to the last exposure, the heavy use group and the no use group are looking pretty similar in regards to the peak distress they're feeling at each session and the end distress they're feeling when they finish session. So we're seeing less change here um, than we saw in the previous slide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, so, yeah that's a, and that's a great point and actually something I was just about to touch on, um, which is that um, probably what we're seeing here is greater fear activation. 
So the cannabis use group is getting at more fear within the exposure um, than the, than the non-use group. That's a very good guess on what's happening here, um, which in and of itself is really interesting because <laughs> the anxiolytic effects of cannabis might have us a little concerned that that's not going to happen. Um, and I think what this data shows, you know, it does show that we might have more fear reduction and fear extinction within session for cannabis users, um, but not so much between. So could we say that this is enhancing the, the, the therapeutic extinction process? I don't know if we would go that far, but we probably can say it's not getting in the way. Um, which was another concern. Would it be detrimental? Mm -hmm. And we're not. We are seeing this fear activation and we are seeing them look very much like their no using counterparts. Yeah. Um, how, do, how does that inside slope look compared to what you expect for this type of intervention? You mean the previous, the within session or the between? This, this the between. Point. It's looking less steep than you might expect. Yeah. yeah, you probably were wondering about that. Although, you know, with the cat, you mean, remember we're doing a very stripped down protocol, right? So we might expect less degree of change. And it's always that question of, is less change in more people who actually do the treatment better than more change, but fewer people who are willing to do it, right? And so it's always that balance. Um, so that could be one explanation. Although the other explanation, I think, is that there's been increasing attention paid to the fact that um, within session distress reduction and between session redu stress reduction may not be crucial to extinction learning happening and may not be crucial to exposure therapy outcomes. That there's lots of other inhibitory processes and new learning and new meaning at play in humans who are doing exposure therapy. And so it may not be crucial for outcome. And we haven't looked at outcome data yet for obvious reasons since we're still in the middle of the trial. Um, but it will be really interesting to see what we see there, right? D does it matter that maybe this slope, this slope isn't quite as steep? But you are right that in a traditional PE protocol where you do the 10 sessions out of session, we would expect a much more of a change. Yeah. Yes. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I think, um, uh, you know, some conclusions that I can give. Um, I think it's really important that we continue work where we can link mechanisms to outcome so that we can get better understanding of processes that are implicated in a very vulnerable group of patients. Um, in terms of future directions that we're hoping to take, um, we're hoping to test some of these, sh some shared vulnerability factors. So we're really interested in exploring um, factors that might explain the overlap of PTSD and cannabis um, outside of extinction learning. So things like fear processes and reward processes and how that yin and yang goes together since we know that both fear and reward are heavily implicated in cannabis and PTSD. Um, we're also look, interested in looking at transdiagnostic treatment approaches to maybe push on some of these shared vulnerabilities. And we're interested in looking at patient attitudes and preferences as well. So we do know that a lot of patients maybe aren't interested in changing their cannabis use, um, and they are interested in its continuation. And how does that play into treatment? Right. Um, and remember, in the study that we're doing right now, there's no ask to do that. Um, and that's probably helped our recruitment immensely, if I had to guess. And our drop out rates, too, potentially. Right. Um, and that may be OK. Or, um, or we may want to see if we can do better than that. Right. It, it just depends on kind of how things fall. Um, so, you know, I think it is still very unclear about whether cannabis use is a problem or a solution um, for individuals with PTSD. And it likely depends on a variety of individual factors, contextual factors, behavioral factors that are going to really add up to whether or not it's going to help or harm a given individual. Um, and it's really important to remember that research in this area is very nuanced. There's a lot of different layers and levels to how we study the interaction of PTSD symptoms and cannabis. Um, we understand that there's a lot of yes buts and what ifs and yeah maybes <laughs> of what we know so far. Um, but it, it isn't necessarily that way in the kind of the court of public opinion, right? I mean, the reality is that the acceptability and the attitudes on cannabis, especially as it relates to PTSD, are pretty overwhelmingly positive in a lot of ways. Um, a very quick Google search, 30 seconds, um, it could get you images like this where it's pretty clear that the messages being sent out there are that cannabis is an effective treatment for PTSD um, and a, a harm reduction treatment for PTSD. And these are the messages that our patients are absorbing every day. And that's gonna make a difference in terms of how they approach their recovery following trauma exposure. And the reality is we do have a lot of really good treatments for PTSD that make changes in the underlying processes and mechanisms of what we think sustains the disorder. And whether cannabis can also be something like that sort of still remains to be, remains to be seen. Um, but personally, I think our patients deserve that. And so to the extent that we can do some more research to really figure out whether or not that's 
that's there, um, I think is a really fruitful and interesting place to go. Um, so I want to thank everyone really much um, for listening and um, for, for being here today. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is one study and one area of research that I have going on. I also have some um, research going on in alcohol use and sexual assault. Um, Project Bright, this is my shameless recruitment plug. <laughs> um, I'm gonna put up the contact information. It's a study that's in its very last year of recruiting patients. We're looking for women who are in the acute phase following sexual assault. Um, so if you work with those kinds of patient populations, please come talk to me. I would love to, to tell you more about the study or if you just have an interest in it. Um, I wanna thank all of the folks who can collaborate with me and work on the research that I presented today, particularly Heidi Ogiletto, who can be here, um, but is our study coordinator and does the lion's share of the work on this project, as well as all of my other collaborators and project staff. Um, I want to thank my funding agencies, NIDA and NHLA. And then finally, I want to give a very special thanks to the patients who participate in our studies. Um, there's no way we could do this work without them. Uh, and I'm consistently awed by their willingness to come in and work with us and trust us with their recovery and tell us their stories. And for that, I'm extremely grateful. So um, this is the contact information for both project sites the project step that I just talked about and project right and um, I'm going to leave that up there while I take any last questions. So, thank you. Yeah. Oh sorry. Stable meds, does that mean that you allow people on benzodiazepines? Um, under a certain dose. So if the doses are considered too high, um, so Rick Reese, who's in our department, who couldn't be here today, um, uh, but he's our medical director on the project, and he has, <laughs> worked, sorry, he has worked with us to come up with doses of the common benzodiazepines that seem probably more problematic. Um, so we do take patients as long as they're below those certain thresholds. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Yeah, we do at baseline. So at baseline, everyone does one of the, the pee cups where you pull the thing, <laughs> and we, we look for just the presence or absence of opiates and benzos and cocaine and um, cannabis and all of, you know other common drugs that are used um, to basically to verify, to make sure that we're getting accurate information from the patients in terms of which group they really belong in. Um, and then they don't do the follow-up tests after that. They just do that one to... No. Just that one time. Yeah. And remember, treatment's only six days. So we finish in a week and a half. So, uh, you know, it is certainly possible that someone could engage in substance use in that time and we might not know about it. Um, but hopefully not. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions? I know I ran a little bit over. Yeah. Have you seen a difference in yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and we don't have a requirement. So we, me we measure a lot of information on what they're using. Um, and actually, just as I was like literally unpacking my stuff here to give this talk, in my email popped up the uh, urine analyses for the, the CBD metabolites. <laughs> I have not looked at them yet. I will open it and it will be a very complicated spreadsheet with a lot of numbers. But yes, we are looking at those and we're going to hope to be able to make some conclusions about that as well. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. If somebody were to ask you, hey doc, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep using cannabis mm -hmm. while going through my exposure mm -hmm. therapy, but should I be using it before or after? Is there any data to make a recommendation about the timing? So there's theoretical data potentially. So, you know, if you're thinking of it from this extinction perspective and you really think it could facilitate it, you'd say before. It needs to be on board during the extinction learning. There's also a whole other body of literature that is, I'm not as familiar with, um, but that talks about the effects of cannabis on um, memory consolidation, which would maybe indicate after, right? And so, I, you know, I think it depends. I think right now the data that we have is not strong enough to make those recommendations one way or another. I think the only thing that I've learned so far over the course of what we've done is that um, I would not say you need to stop cannabis for me to treat you with exposure therapy. And I would not say, I, you know, with alcohol and even benzodiazepines, I make pretty, con like, pretty firm agreements with my patients that you, if you're going to continue to use, you need to not use right before you come to session because what we do that day may not work as well. And I'm not willing to take that risk. I don't know that I'd say the same thing with cannabis, not from what we're seeing um, and not from what anecdotally I'm hearing from the patients that are going through our trial and what I'm seeing in terms of how they're looking at, at post-treatment and follow-up. So I'd be more 
more squishy on that, right? <laughs> um, because many of our patients definitely are, I mean, you can tell that they're using and then coming to session. I, I'm a therapist on the trial, I can tell. <laughs> um, but it doesn't seem to interfere with the way the session goes. And so not in the same way where something like alcohol or benzos would. Um, so I don't know that I would, I wouldn't set a limit of I will not do this as I would with other substances, but I don't know that I'd encourage it either at this point, either before or after session. Yeah, the, inter the stuff on memory consolidation is really interesting though, if you're interested in that. I just don't, it's not my area of what I'm doing right now, but it is really interesting stuff. Other questions? Okay, thank you so much, I appreciate it.